Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel, and I'm going to take a little bit of a break from the series I started with, and we'll discuss uh, a very important topic. It's actually about proportion and what it means uh, exactly, and how we got the idea and how it led to a lot of the a lot of the concepts that we now deal with in mathematics so let's just close this window and we can continue so what i've done here is i've gone to this particular site here i think uh, it's a very common site it's the mathematical association of america and uh, i just looked at something they're discussing here about proportion. And uh, what's interesting to note in this particular proposition here is that they talk about area, but area is never properly defined in the elements. There are some allusions to the concept. So the allusions <clears throat> come, for example, in several places. Uh, the very first place is in book one, where it talks about area uh, being the concept of, or, or a sur being, being a surface that has length and breadth. So length and breadth obviously is some magnitude, which is only defined later on as a concept in book five. Uh, there are several words which are used in the elements uh, for example, the very first one that you see here is chorion. So it says, to paralilogramon chorion e apenandion plevre te ke vonia ise aliles isin ke i dia metros afta dicha temni. Okay, so basically what it says is that if you have a parallelogram like this then the opposite sides and angles are equal to one another and a diagonal cuts cuts them in half actually that's not strictly speaking true it cuts the whole figure in half it doesn't cut them in half okay and normally when uh, the concept of area is discussed in the elements it's discussed in terms of proportion. So what does proportion mean? Now, <clears throat> if you, like myself, are self-taught in Greek, and you type in the word proportion, let's say into something like uh, Google Translate, you'll get something here which says, pososto, pososto, okay? And that's not quite the right word. The right word is analogia, okay? And of course, a better word or a very common word in Greek is analogos, analogos, or analogos. Okay, <clears throat> um, depending on how uh, it's used, the accent may not be in the same place, and even the particular grammar might be slightly different. But at any rate, uh, what does proportion mean? Okay, well, the definition given here says a part, share, or number considered in comparative relation to a whole. Well, that's not strictly speaking true. A proportion is really a comparison of similar sizes or magnitudes, okay? So <clears throat> if we had to look at this word analogos, it means a consideration, right? Or accordingly or proportionally. Now notice down here where we have uh, another suggestion here, the accent is on the last syllable, gos. And in here it's on law, analogos, and here it's analogos. Okay, but anyway, um, I'm not gonna focus too much on the grammar, but the proportion is simply, <clears throat> Uh, used in the elements and in the derivation of 
proportionality as the idea of two magnitudes which are compared. In other words, a ratio, all right? So now let's go to this main diagram here, which is in one of the propositions, and you'll see it usually stated like this, where you have, you know, uh, the area of triangle ABE to the area of triangle DEB. But these areas here are not, they're just ideas at this stage, okay? In other words, they're not well defined. Uh, as I said, the first uh, allusion to the concept of area in the elements is that it's a surface with length and breadth, okay? And then the next allusion is that it is a plane number, okay? A plane number. Plane written as plane, like that, okay? A plane number. And the first allusion to volume is a solid number. All right, so at any rate, so what this says here is that the space in this region here, ABE, over the space in DEB is equal to what you see on the right hand side here, right? And uh, it's interesting to note that any between any two parallel lines, and of course I've shown you how to derive the concept of parallel without using the nonsense of axioms or postulates. In other words, you don't just have to accept it. If you go to chapter four of my chapter, just let me move this out of the way here. Chapter four of my of the most important book in mathematics, this book here, um, you'll see that everything is systematically defined, okay? So you don't have to accept anything on faith. Um, and, and in this book, I show you, in this chapter, I show you how to derive all the definitions. But I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but there are some interesting things here that you've never thought of before or even seen. And you can actually understand what it means for uh, something to be a magnitude or a number and the very uh, first primitive concepts. So everything begins with the idea of a location or a point. And you can read all about it here in this chapter. I will be going over this at some or other time in my series called what you what your educators uh, what your ignorant educators could not tell you but um, i don't want to focus on that right now so i'm wandering all over the place let me go back to what i'm talking about which is the concept of proportion okay so um move this back up here again right so now <clears throat> uh everything in mathematics actually comes from the ideas that start off in this uh, in this particular theorem. So if you go to the actual theorem, I think it's in book six and proposition two. So let's just go there, uh, uh, close that up. I think it's this one here. Yeah, so everything starts off here uh, with relation to the arithmetic operators and uh, algebra and equations and everything starts taking uh, shape with this particular proposition. Okay, so <clears throat> um, in this particular case here, you'll see that if you have a parallelogram, all right, so let's just draw a little parallelogram here. So if you have two parallel lines like that, then what it's telling you is that if you draw a triangle on any uh, on any base, which is the same for another triangle, so this the space contained between this triangle is the same as between this triangle and between any other triangle, okay, any other triangle that's on the same base, okay? So the space or the area, okay? The space or the area. And this is also the starting point of how we know that 
a triangle is half the area of the parallelogram that contains it because you can always by symmetry show that a parallelogram contains two triangles simply by dividing that parallelogram into two parts right one part here and another part here and the greek word chorion or chorio means you know space or to divide or to partition in such a way that you have an equal space once a partition takes place or an equal area and so from this here uh, we get the idea of proportion so we can say that a particular ratio for example be right uh, be to cd to cd let's write it down like that first okay be to cd is equal or is the same is the same as another ratio say a b a b to a c okay and and so these ratios here now what does this mean this literally means the magnitude be the idea of the size of this be compared with the size of cd at this stage here there is no such thing as number do you get it numbers only came much later okay in book seven right so the idea of size or magnitude begins in book five right and later on in book six where they start discussing uh the equalities that come out of uh, proportion and similar triangles so book six is all about similar triangles and this is where you get uh the first notions uh, that we deal with in terms of arithmetic operators so for example later on after we've proved uh, the theory of similar triangles we can come along here and say well this uh, magnitude here this line this blue line here is in proportion to the black line and the same ratio of the red line to the blue line is equal to this comparison here right and from this we can def define multiplication and division because the length of this blue line times the light blue line is equal to the red line so at this stage here we don't we don't even have numbers and, and the operation of multiplication is defined geometrically similarly the operation of division is also defined geometrically this is where we get division and multiplication from long before the idea of number even arises and you'll see i have a separate video on this particular uh, topic the topic of the theory of fractions and you can go to that video and watch it it's called the theory of fractions um, just type in the theory of fractions in youtube followed by my name and you should be able to get there so i'm sorry that i'm going slowly uh, but i am 50 almost 57 years old and i don't think as fast as i used to anymore so i am talking a little slowly some of you might be bored but bear with me because you will learn more than you've ever learned in your entire school life or your university and if you're a professor of mathematics you will finally begin to understand mathematics which you've never understood before okay so uh these ideas led to the theory of fractions and numbers and everything else and going back to this diagram here when we literally write when we write down something like be colon cd we, we what this means is the comparison of be with cd doesn't only have to be a length by the way it can be anything else it can be a mass a volume an area all these things are derived from ratios and when i say that everything is ratio it's true and everything in mathematics is based on the ratio 
Without the ratio, you don't have any mathematics. And this is where it comes from. If you look at the original Greek, where it discusses these things, it will talk many times of the word uh, logos or ratio. Logos uh, has a meaning which which talks about ratios, okay, which talks about proportions. In other words, you're looking at the size of one object and comparing it uh, with the emphasis on comparison with another object, right? So you have to think of these things very slowly and very deeply. And then you will be able to arrive at a better understanding. So <clears throat> everything can be derived systematically from nothing. I've said that many times, but I'm repeating it here because uh, the orangutans in the Church of Academia or mainstream academia, which I also called the big stupid, uh, have been propagating these lies of axioms and postulates. There are no axioms and postulates in mathematics. Those notions are wrong. Um, and of course, if you study my videos, you will see these things. So very well, I've been jabbering along here, uh, talking about these concepts, uh, the concept of area, proportion, but that's literally where we get the idea. This is literally where we get the idea of proportions. In other words, from the study of similar triangles. And later on, uh, we continue to deal with this concept and we go from ratio to number. So while this is written down in the form of a ratio, it becomes a number when we write B E over C D. And of course, uh, I haven't actually stated the measure here, but the next step is to state the measure of this ratio. In other words, how long is B E over C D as you see in this applet here. So for example, uh, much later, we can talk about these lengths here in terms of the colors, identifying them, giving them names by the colors. But if we don't have this diagram, we want to be able to talk about them in terms of measure, right? So we'll turn on the labels. Ah, it turns out that the measure, we can refer to this line as three. We can refer to this line as one, that line as one, this line as this line here as three. And if we move these things along like that, and like this, see, then all these lines have measure here. These distances or lengths have measure, and we can talk about them. So as you see, we can now replace these stars here by the names of the lines. Do you see now why there is no such thing as a real number? Because it's impossible to give all these distances names. Why is that so? Because you cannot measure most of them. For example, square root two, pi, e, etc. Those have no measure, right? So, so we simply resort to giving them a name in terms of a symbol. For example, we, we simply, instead of, if we try to have 3.1 here, for example, or the distance of pi, Theoretically, you could have you could uh, have a distance here which is approximately pi, right? But let me go over here and just try to write on the screen. Okay, screen sketch. So now, so for example, uh, instead of referring to this as three point one four one five nine dot dot dot, we just write pi. But you, you cannot name all these distances here. Even with symbols, you cannot name them. There's simply no way to do that. It's impossible. It's what I call a super task, all right? And a super task is nonsense because infinity is nonsense. So you really cannot uh, give uh, all these distances a name. Right, so there's the real, the real number line is a myth. There's no such thing as a real number line. There's a rational number line, yes. But a real number line, that's absolute bullshit. Um, so just remember that. And remember that there is no such thing as any rational number because a number is the measure of a magnitude, okay? 
And when we, when we come up with a measure of a magnitude, we're actually giving these magnitude, magnitudes which are expressed in terms of distance, we're giving them names, right? You get that? We're giving them names. So we choose a unit, and it doesn't matter how we choose the unit. We can choose any unit we like, and then we give all the other lines or lengths names. And that's what it means to uh, measure. Okay. Now, for example, George Cantor, when he tried to define what is a countable set, he used the set of natural numbers <laughs> because they are systematically nameable. In other words, you can, you can actually list the natural numbers because you can give them all names using a radix system. Isn't that so? So, for example, you can say one, two, three, etc. Because in terms of a radix, you have units, hun uh, tenths, hundreds, etc. And here you have tenths, hundreds, etc. So you can systematically name these one, two, three, ten, etc. And, and these here are the names. That's what it means for a set to be countable. If and only a set is countable if and only if its members can be systematically named. That's what Cantor meant. Not the bullshit that you hear in that your professors of mathematics tell you that it can be placed into a bijection with the set of natural numbers. That's just a consequence. Why did Cantor choose the natural numbers? Because they can all be systematically named, and your professors are morons. Okay. So they did, your professors don't understand these things, and that's why you don't understand, because you're simply learning the bullshit that they're stuffing down your throat. Okay, now, so, uh, so there, this is how we got the operations of arithmetic. And similarly, uh, you can see also that the subtraction and addition is also demonstrated geometrically long before even division and subtraction, okay? And this goes back to the very first uh, definition of straight line and the extended line. It's not a, an axiom, it's, it's, it's a requirement or a claim. And if you go back here to the book of elements, the first book, and you look at the definitions, it's, uh, it's stated under postulates, they're not actually postulates in, Greeks. Would, in Greek, would you believe that the word action doesn't even appear in any of the elements, neither does postulates, and this word itis, though, appears only once in the entire 13 books. So going back here to the definition of subtraction addition, it's a, a consequence of this requirement here to produce a finite straight line continuously and also the converse to reduce it continuously, okay? So at any rate, uh, I hope you've, I hope I've stimulated you to think about these things for yourself and to realize um, that proportion started with, with the idea, the ideas that arose out of uh, similar triangles. Sorry, I'm out of breath. Um, okay, so if you have any questions, write them down in the comment section, and I'll answer them for you, or I'll try to, to get around to answering them for you. My name is John Gabriel, and this is the New Calculus Channel. Hopefully, I'll be able to get back to the series, which I started earlier. Till next time. Goodbye.